Here you go, Ronnie and Madeline. Okay, awesome. You can have these chairs, and I don't know if you want to... Hi, uh, to those of you who are staying, um, I'm not sure whether you're staying because the next film is going to be in Sundance 1, um, but um, I'd love to hear your reactions to the film. Anybody want to start out? We're all in this together in the sense that this is the first time that um, I think everybody here, except for maybe Ben, um, has seen this film. I've only seen the trailers and read things about it, but I'd like to know um, some of your thoughts. Worthwhile being in the festival? Yes. Um, voting, voting five? Yes. What did, why? What did you like about it? Somebody in back row? Go ahead. Because they won, it's nice to see a film where some where the right person wins. A story well told. I'll just repeat what you said. Um, story very well told, beautifully filmed, very suspenseful. Um, one of the things that, um, I mean, it seems as though the, the message is fairly obvious in terms of why this bank um, compared to um, huge banks, larger banks, other banks um, that were much more, uh, that were um, implicated in the financial crisis. Um, and um, got away scot-free. Um, do you hold with one of, the, one of the tenets of the film that because this was a small bank, because this was a bank that was culturally um, different and culturally sensitive to a different group of people, that they were made, um, that, that they became a kind of um, easy example for um, for the district attorney. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Go ahead. I don't necessarily because I know a lot of community bankers that were realtors, and they all went through a lot of investigation during that time. They didn't get in. They didn't have to go to court, though. So in that way, maybe this was. Um, I think that. The way this community does business is what brought it on. So the way they do business, for instance, and in backing up their loans is different than the way another community bank might do so, in that they showed us that very clearly, that you borrow $9,000 from your brother and that's how you buy your house. And that, that 9,000 is sort of cloudy as to where that comes from and if it ever gets paid back that you may not see that. It's more clear in other community banks. And I think in this way, because they are in Chinatown that, and the way they do business with cash. So I guess my question to you would be, citing the film, that this was a case where discretion was uh, perhaps an issue that the government prosecuted over the space of five years um, to an extraordinary amount of money that Abacus Bank had to spend $10 million of its own money to defend themselves, if I understood that correctly, and that at the very end of the film it said that Abacus was, in fact, receiving compliance counseling um, to indicate that perhaps it was a question of bank management and compliance rather than wrongdoing, and that that was something that could have been handled in a completely different way. And was for all the other community banks. So maybe they were out to get, to get this community. I don't know if that's the reason. One of the other points that, that I thought was interesting in the film was that the, that the, the quote that um, by the um, the patriarch and the owner of the bank, that the damage had been done, that the damage had been done to the Chinese community, that the damage had been done to the bank. Any reactions to that? Agree. You agree? Yeah. Um, 
the um, director said that one of the reasons he chose to make this film was it was such a little known story of the 2008 uh, uh, mortgage and lending crisis, but in the Chinese American community in New York, this was covered almost every day in the newspapers and their television for five years. So that also points to the different worlds that we live in in, uh, in the United States. We assume that we, the culture we experience is the culture everyone else is experiencing and is a great example of another one. Could you wait a second? The microphone's heading your way. Sorry. It's okay. Yeah, I didn't either. No, I thought this was a good film festival edition because it was the family. You know, there was this very personal story going on there. But Frontline can tend to be sometimes, you know, kind of removed and just showing the overall story. But this was definitely, you know, had the, the entire personal approach to that. It made it a very good documentary. So I have a question that, that I want to ask us that goes beyond this film, which has to do with, do you, as members of the Madison community, knowing that there are refugees coming into this community, think that, and that we are, that we're, we're a city that has sister city relationships um, with, um, with other cities and other countries, that we are, um, in some respects, a sanctuary city. What do you think we know about refugee culture? I was interested to see that there was an article in today's, actually, I think it was, well, it was yesterday's Isthmus, because today is Friday, um, that talked about how there was a, uh, Russian, um, a Russian grocery store on the far west side of town, and that even the people who are Russian who, who have opened it did not know that there was a significant Russian community in Madison that could actually sustain this store. Um, so what that said to me was, boy, we don't know a whole lot. Um, that, but that's my, that, that was my reaction. I don't, I don't know about the rest of you, but I'd like to know. Yes. How many savings deposit boxes? To me, that was normal because I, I d dealing with some of the immigrant communities as a realtor. Sometimes there's they don't trust banks because they are coming from a country that maybe isn't as safe to put your money in the bank as it is in the United States. Like we trusted our banks up until 2008. So um, a lot of them would come and ask if they could bring cash to closings. I kid you not. And they would have $40,000 under the mattress. And so that didn't surprise me when he said, look at all of our savings deposits boxes. This is where they keep their money, their valuables. What about the contrast between this film and It's a Wonderful Life? you know, that this very iconic American film is perhaps being seen in a, in a, at a different time, um, in a different context, but the story is very much the same. That I thought was um, a wonderful, I don't know whether trope is the right word, but a wonderful way of framing this film that this is us now. We're, we're a different country. Or maybe we're the same country, but we're just now perhaps more aware of the different ethnicities um, and races and creeds and colors and whatever else. Um, I don't know, help me out folks, I'm not the only one. <laughs> um, it's been a real pleasure to be involved with Open Doors for uh, Refugees this year. As Ronnie mentioned earlier, we're only a year old. Uh, a, a few people uh, 
were angry about uh, a situation that was even before there were the executive orders, but just when the governors in the surrounding states uh, started saying that, you know, our state would not be welcoming to refugees and some of us started to, to question that and form an interested group. The minute we got positive and started in on action, it was just such a relief to be doing, to, to be standing up um, for these values that we believed in and things that uh, made made the country strong. And we've had several events, a soup for Syria and a speaker who had visited a uh, refugee camp in Jordan. And um, over these several events, we have a, a list of supporters of uh, 700, 750 interested people without even trying. And we hope that there will be 750 additional people who will come uh, to the Barrymore. And we hope that you will be one of them on the 26th of, um, what's the month? April, April coming right up when you have a film festival uh, withdra withdrawal. Because we, we really hope that it's not just a fundraiser for the refugee, but it's for your standing up and saying, I want to be counted as someone who wants to uh, make Madison a welcoming community. And the, um, uh, I saw Todd uh, raise your hands, uh, speak up. Constantly changing. I'm, I'm glad you said that. Were you able to hear what uh, what he said? Um, okay, th uh, thank you for that. But we can't understand a community whose value that when when we're ignorant of them, it's so easy to misunderstand. So I, I guess I was saying that being a part of this organization has really helped me. I never would have known that there were apartment buildings in Madison where 75% of the people speak Arabic. Um, you know, I mean, that's not, that's not the Madison I know. And when you think of just people being called refugees and coming in uh, to the United States, uh, it's, it's been evident that the president didn't know the meaning of, uh, you know, the United States uh, State Department vetting. I mean, just think if it was you, would you subject yourself to the vetting process that all of the refugees who have arrived in Madison from the Middle East have had to go through? We're just reading this aid to government agencies, including the National Counterterrorism Center, FBI, Department of Homeland Security, and State Department are involved. Six security databases are checked against one another. Five separate background checks are done. Four biometric security checks, that means fingerprints, checked against the multiple databases. And three separate in-person interviews. Turn the page. And two interagency security checks running data against criminal intelligence and terrorism databases. And then people that we found that were in route to Madison and were caught up in this January um, uh, delay or, you know, uh, have to start all over again, you know, two, two years that they've been going through this. And then all those uh, clearances expire, they start over again. So when they arrive in Madison, they already have gone through all of this. I mean, it's a different, they've already been incredibly discriminated against by our processes in, a, in addition, of course, to what they've uh, gone through and fleeing against. Yeah, go ahead. Do you have a website or other? Yes, thank you for asking. We have two websites. One is opendoorsforrefugees.org, and we also have a Facebook page. Um, so just go to Facebook and look for Open Doors for Refugees on Facebook. Um, please like us. Um, we monthly have, we have um, monthly meetings for the general public, um, and then if you decide to join specific 
um, interest groups within the organization, then there are sub-meetings, um, you know, like last Tuesday, next Tuesday, the Tuesday after that. Um, and, um, and it's really interesting to see how many people um, actually just show up and say, um, I'd like to help in whatever way um, that we can. Um, there's also information um, that shows up on Facebook in terms of where to make donations. Um, we work with um, some of the Muslim communities in town and mosques, so that if there are charitable drives that are on the part of the mosques, you'll probably find that information also on um, our Facebook page. Um, we have a couple of events coming up after April the 26th. There's a community picnic in May, and then there is, in July, there's going to be an all-day, um, a kind of music fest. Um, and so please look for those things as well. And I just wanted to thank you um, for hanging around and, um, and enjoy the festival. And please go to other films and... Um, and enjoy them. Thank you, Ben, for bringing such a wonderful film to the festival. Thank you. And, and, and uh, if you liked the film, which I'm sure you did, uh, we're showing it again tomorrow at 11, and we're going to do one of these Q&As after that as well. So tell your friends and neighbors and strangers and, strangers and yes. Strangers in Paradise and, next week. Oh, and Strangers in Paradise. Yeah. Yeah. Tomorrow but tell strangers at 11. Too. Yes. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. <laughs>